Southern Ocean Carbon Climate Observations and Modeling. I wish it was still SOBOM. I know, SOBOM was awesome. <laughs> SOBOM was our, uh, our bid for $50 million out of the Science and Technology Center program at NSF, which we actually made it through the Blue Ribbon panel. We were one of the five selected and then got a lovely phone call saying, you've been sequestered. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine it was hard to get out of bed that July. But I blame all of this, of course, on Steve Rintoul. Because I came down to the Deep Ocean Workshop last time I was here in Hobart, and I said, Steve, I'm a modeler. This looks awesome. How can I help? And he said, just send money. <laughs> so I went home, and I said, I called up Jorge Sarmento, and I said, the biggest grant they make at NSF is these science and technology centers. We've got to get one for the Southern Ocean. He's like, well, they won't give it to the modelers. We've got to find some ops. <laughs> and so we called Lynn, <laughs> Lynn Talley. And of course, that's now we have this, which is not 50. It's only 21 million out of polar programs with a chunk from NASA and a, chunk, a, bit, a large chunk from NOAA. And, uh, and thanks to uh, Oscar and Emmanuel Boss, we have some from NASA to put optical sensors on. But basically, it's this. Unlocking the mysteries of the Southern Ocean, it's basically in uh, floats, biogeochemically censored floats into the Southern Ocean, combined with a large um, modeling presence as well, um, and high resolution uh, coupled climate models supported out of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at NOAA. So uh, these are the people involved. Um, it's led by Jorge Sarmento at Princeton University, and the associate director is Ken Johnson, responsible for our nitrate and pH sensors. And uh, the lead for the OBS is Lynn Talley, co-led by Steve Reiser at the University of Washington, who actually builds our floats. I'm leading the modeling with <laughs> help from Jorge. <laughs> and then we have a fantastic broader impacts component, which is, uh, yeah, I know he let me lead. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> but uh, so with Heidi Cullen at Climate Central, which has really made it possible to, we did everything from videos to you name it. I'll show you a little bit here. So the main research goals were not small. Uh, but then they were giving us a lot of money, so we had to, we had, it was gonna be big. Quantify and understand the role of the regions of the Southern Ocean in carbon cycling. So to take another sports metaphor, let's go basketball. Instead of doing man-to-man, -man, we're going zone. Get them deployed, cover all the regions, and get 150 to 200 floats by geochemically censored out into the whole Southern Ocean over the five year, we have six years, um, to deploy them. And our plan is actually to transition it to NOAA or to Argo as, um, to actually expand this, not just for now, but maybe to global BGC Argo. Develop the scientific basis for projecting, and this, of course, means a coupled climate model. There is no way to do the future except in a coupled climate model. It's the only way. So uh, the contribution of the Southern Ocean to the future trajectory of carbon acidification, nutrient cycling, and heat uptake. So, uh, so the new observing system that we're trying to build here is there's only two pH profiles found south of 40 south in the database for the Austral winter. Two. That's a whole, especially when we talk acidification or anything else really with the carbon system, two. How's that for a spectacular hole? So this is just an animation. The background is the upwelling of uh, nitrate that's um, uh, modeled by the high resolution, you know, five to 10 kilometer ocean, fully coupled to an atmosphere, CM2.6 out of GFDL. So that's the background. On top of it is laid the observed nitrate measurements, full stop, all the ones that have been made. We leave them on there for 10 years so that you can actually see where they were. But it's utterly inadequate to sample the variability. One, there's just no way. You can see it visually. Now we're going to add in what we project will be the impact of our new floats. It's not perfectly the deployment, but it was uh, one of our earlier estimates of what it was going to look like. This is what we want to do, is deploy enough sensors, get enough floats, get enough profiles so that we can actually cover the Southern Ocean. Uh, so the goal is to measure 740 profiles per month, every month. Uh, of the year using Argo floats. And of course, remember, there were two forever in the Southern o Ocean winter. So here we go. This is the plan. So the work proposed over six years to NSF involves these cruises. One of the main problems with getting these floats to work is the calibration. To be climate ready, we have to have every single float must be calibrated for, the, for nutrients, for pH, and for oxygen when we deploy them. Full cast is required. So that's what makes a SOCOM float, is you have to have two of the suite of our biogeochemical sensors and calibration, because otherwise we can't compare globally getting this array out. So it's a big, sort of a very important focus of the work. 
We're also using, of course, Matt Maslow's fantastic uh, Southern Ocean State Estimate, assimilating all this fabulous data so that people like me in the modeling community can actually use it. Um, now, he can't project forward 20 or 30 years the way I can, but I can't get the state right. I'm not allowed to assimilate anything, right? So this is a nice way to actually really work on getting the processes right in the models, in the climate models. Uh, new advances too, this uh, high resolution Earth system models, we've actually got CM2.6 has a 0.1 degree resolution in the ocean and uh, 50, uh, 100 kilometers in the atmosphere, which is significantly higher than anything else you'll find. And we have doubling runs of CO2 and other actual climate process runs, which is fantastic, something really to work from. And uh, so we've also got great theme crosscuts, not just uh, the carbon uptake and acidification, but the biology, chemistry and the physics both from the observation side and the modeling side, and we're trying to feed them into our, global, our broader impacts as well. So this was a big focus of the way we've organized. So the core support at $3.5 million a year is from polar programs at the NSF. 50% of our Argo equivalent floats are provided by Argo uh, and Steve Priotrowitz. Um, the NOAA GFDL has provided the runs, actually, for our large-scale experiments in the high-resolution coupled climate model simulations. And uh, NASA, thanks Oscar and Emmanuel, put uh, optical sensors on about a third of our floats. So very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then, so I'll just give you an uh, observations year one. We're about eight months into our first year of uh, deployments. Making the floats, cruises and calibration, data management, float data QC, calibration data QC, and state estimation. So float assembly and deployment, I'm just giving you some pretty pictures, not actually showing you how this all works. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of Lynn slides on the crew's principal investigators and the teams, the way they're organized. So the array will grow to be about 200 floats, maybe a little less with failure, with pH, oxygen, and nitrate, bioptics, five to seven year life, year round coverage. And they work under ice as well. They have ice avoidance software. Fantastic. So these are the results from the pre-SOCOM cruise. We got an eager grant when we got hamstrung by the STC. Before we got picked up by Polar Programs, we got an eager grant to actually deploy floats from the P-16 Go Ship cruise, which uh, Lynn Talley was the uh, chief scientist on. You can see here's the line. For, that this is the line from P-16. And here are the floats that were deployed on the leg. And you can actually see down here, you're actually looking at the pH along these lines, which is fantastic. It's really unprecedented, never been done. This is extraordinary. So here are the P16 floats providing the first view of the seasonal carbon cycle in the Southern Ocean. ka <laughs> Sorry, it's very exciting. Chlorophyll, pH in situ, nitrate, and temperature along here. It's fantastic. So cruise organization, calibration, data availability. How do we deploy the float shown in yellow? How do we collect calibration data for the float shown in yellow? Uh, Pre-cruise planning, where to deploy them. Uh, and the SOCOM group, is it's a group effort to actually get all the relevant information, both from the modeling side and the ops side. Let me, let me just show you. So here is a saucy tracer release output from Matt Saucy, but Jimbo Wang actually did the experiment, I think, with the, tra the die release. And here is in HICOM, an Aussie model particle release done by Igor Kamikovich at UMiami. This is how we, we, we plan. Isn't it amazing? Actually, information from the models about where we might want to deploy and what we might actually capture in the variability. Fantastic. So year one progress, 25 floats deployed in year one, 23 floats operating normally. Uh, parameters measured, several different configurations, but this is the range. All parked at 1,000 decibars, profiled at 1,750 or 2,000 meter decibars. Many equipped with ice avoidance software, all adjusted using deployment tasks. So they were deployed by the Palmer and the Polar Stern and the Investigator. So uh, one cruise was canceled, the one to the Argentine base on OLI because of Navis float problems for the two floats that were scheduled to go out. Uh, let's see. So here were the three cruises. This one, of course, was canceled. Uh, here was year one progress on <coughs> one of the floats, just so you can see. Uh, what's working, what's not, we're pretty excited because Glowdown version one suggests that the pH is consistent with the climatology, so we're pretty excited. We've also got algorithm development going on with Lori Juranic and Dick Feely, who are working on this with uh, grad student Nancy Williams on actually getting us these lovely algorithms, which is fantastic. So modeling, I'm going to show you a little bit about this because it's 
essential to our, it's central to the program as well. So uh, we have different, we have OSSEs, the sim, uh, uh, observ Observing System Simulation Experiments, Carbon Algorithm Development by Lori Drake, Dick Finley, and Nancy Williams, High Resolution Model Analysis, <coughs> DeFore, Frederick Morris, and these are postdocs from the Fort Hickson Interest Group. Ultra High Resolution Simulations that we're being supported with uh, by Mike Winton, Steve Griffies, John Dunn, and others. It's fantastic at GPL. Um, and then I've been making metrics, observationally based metrics for the models in the Southern Ocean. And we're also working on a Southern Ocean Model Air Comparison Program, uh, ably helped by Matt England and others here in Australia. So uh, we see this is a Griffies et al. paper, the sea surface height RMS from his 2015. You know, upper to mid depth ocean, quite respectable with energetic eddies in this high res model. Somewhat weak ACC transport and weak Antarctic bottom water transport, always a problem. So, Drake Passage overturning in 30 south transport, this is by Carolina and DeFore, and revision at JPO. Water mass analysis of the anthropogenic CO2 subduction in the ocean interior, this is Ivan Franger. Uh, anthropogenic CO2 and heat uptake, Adele Morrison. And this is Carolina again with mechanisms governing the anthropogenic CO2 uptake, and these are all model results. So metrics, OBS model metrics, and I make all these circles because these are all the sorts of things we're actually trying to test in the models using the fantastic observations from Sears and others. So one of the ones that you don't want to talk about, but which is really <laughs> important in the models, is the westerly winds. This is CFSR uh, reanalysis product out of NSEP, and this is just six of the different models, and you can see that they're you look at the zonal difference, they're very different. And part of the problem we're having is that in phase space, we are not exploring what if the winds were shifted in the model further south than the observed. None of the models do it as far south as they already are observed to be. So we have no idea what would happen if we actually pushed them closer to the coast than because none of the models do it that way. We like it when we actually straddle the observed. So some of the models are high and some are low. So we guess that the ensemble must be somewhere near what would be correct. But instead, what we've got is all the models are equator where shifted and biased, which is a problem. One of the major reasons for, for trying this out. So the latitude of the maximum zone of wind stress, we've got here's where CFSR would put it. And of course, we've got uh, none of the models except Saucy, being the assimilated component, is actually at that latitude. Um, and here's just a whole mess of the different models, including CSIRO and others. Despite improvements, all the models still have the peak vessel in the wrong spot. Here's the, the maximum mixed layer depth, um, where this is again just with the World Ocean Atlas 09, not updating with the quote one from 13. Here's the surface DIC, one of the things we're going to actually be able to test now that we're getting DIC or calculating DIC from our pH and other measurements. Here's the surface nitrate that we were going after, and you notice that the models have pretty radically different upwelling rates of nitrate. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to have a SOMEP, a Southern Ocean Model Air Comparison Project. So we're actually going to push the model winds forward to actually explore that pay space that's been missing from all our couple model results. And we're going to uh, probably also include a freshwater experiment that includes mass melting from the continent, which we have not included, is not included in the current range of models. So, uh, and broader impacts, I have to put this up simply because they've been doing such a great job with her blog and all the rest of it. This is Hannah Sanowski. She was who, uh, she was the one who deployed our floats from the Polar Stern, and she started her oceanography career in my 800 student oceanography class at the University of Arizona. And she liked it so much, she did a research project in my lab and went off to become a po uh, grad student with Jorge and did our first deployments, which yay. So broader impact, Hannah, ta -da! <laughs> And that's all I have. Thank you. Ten, ten minutes. Not bad. <laughs> uh, I think one of the big success of our work is to uh, uh, is, is, is that all consider the consistent way of all group We're submitting right, the all of the the data are going to go through the Argo data stream, it, and you can currently get it on uh, the Mumbari uh, uh, DataViz site. But we have a technician who's just been hired who will be putting the uh, they've agreed to host as long as we format properly. So it will actually be hosted just as Argo. It is Argo compatible. 
soup to nuts. In fact, all the data is on the web within two hours of the float popping up. So come on in, the water's fine. It's all available right now. We're also hosting the simulations uh, from GFDL. They've been kind enough to allow us to host 300 terabytes of high resolution model results at the University of Arizona on our iClimate discovery environment. So while it's not open to the public, you can request access and it, you just, I just slide a little bar and put your name on the list. Steve. All right, I'm not the right person to ask because uh, I, I heard these numbers at the SOCOM annual meeting and they've gotten right out of my brain. So I can't remember. But uh, my understanding from, uh, uh, from Ken was that the, Ken Johnson, that the sensors are all uh, near to ready to be sold, basically. They're already, they, he already has a commercial vendor for the sensors. And the floats, of course, you could already buy. So at this point, it's just an integration issue. You can't just buy them from Steve and Ken. However, these are either available now or should be by the end of summer. It's very soon. I'm sorry if I've got that answer wrong. I apologize in advance, but I believe that's what I heard. Right. Sensors and the floats are available. They just you can't buy them from Ken and Steve. You can do change the the frequency of sampling five days, seven days, ten days, depending on what your battery life or you're in peak bloom season. And I know we've been arguing about that tooth and nail about when and how and whether we risk it and we really want these to last because one of the major things we want to get out of this is budgets. So we can't have the floats dying too soon because we won't get the budgets because the float it takes a while to build out the array. But the main advantages to this float is. You know, in, the, in the Southern Ocean, it's not quite as crucial, but imagine that we wanted to have a global BGCR go array. We can drift into anybody's EEZ, and it's legal, right? They can request that we turn off the, the biogeochemical sensors, and we can do so. But we only do it on request. So in fact, we, um, unlike anybody driving something into your, the law of the sea says, you drive it in, no way. You have to get permission. But if it floats in, that's OK. So we're actually depending on the fact that we can let things drift in anywhere we want and get this fantastic data unless they say we can't, which is fantastic, actually. The leave it and let it go thing actually allows us to get data from the globe, not just from where we are allowed to go. And there are many places where one could imagine that one would like to see this data. Um, I won't mention the country's names. So, so just continuing from that, I mean, the, the temporal length scales of phytoplankton blooms, et cetera, you know, are, are a problem at sampling potentially at 10 days. So I mean, cannot some of the array be sampling at a higher rate than maybe others that can do the budgets? I mean, is, I would love it if compromise? other people put in floats. But I personally, I'm, I'm modeler. I want the climate impact. I cannot have it. If I do not have a global array, I'm desperate to see it. It can't be done without a certain number of floats. If they die too soon over the five to seven year lifetime, I won't get my budget. I want it. So please buy lots of floats, set them to five days, three days, I don't care. But <laughs> and so Lynn and other people will argue they really would like to see the five days too. But I, we worry. The batteries are, we're putting new sensors on this. It's go, we're trying to push them to five and seven years. It's, it's an issue. It's a big issue. And I, I want, we, we are totally arguing about this. It's cool. Gliders then are still got their place. The they do. Approach. They absolutely do. He, one more. I think we're running. running. Well, I was thinking we come back one. I mean, we combine uh, different data sources for like data. Yeah. I think what we're hoping is that we're going to be able to turn up the frequency during certain seasons, like for part of the year. And since we can do that, to change the, we're just hesitant right at the get as we're just deploying the first batches because this is what we're going to build on. But um, we have six years to get everything out and going.
last two questions, Stephen. What are the nine foot? I know people buy a pound and they share them. How do you approach it? Our parking depth is 1,000 meters. We spend eight minutes at the surface. Yeah. Eight minutes every five to 10 days. There's no fouling issue. OK, I take that back. You know those two flows that didn't do well? We put them up through gunk, through snot. And, but apparently Ken has magic, this amazing thing where he blows out the sensor, he flushes it before you know, he actually literally burns it up. So we've got a way to deal with it now. But we did lose two because we hadn't planned on that much snot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you tell the POC windows and stuff are flushed by the by the, uh, That's right. the actual pump. Exactly. So, so yeah, well, and he's be... done something interesting. He took a housing off something, and I can't. You'll have to ask Ken. I'm sorry. If he were here, he would have a much better story for you. When you're on the rice, you'll have to wait until it pops up and dump all the profiles that were taken. Uh, That's right. During that period. And so it's so dead reckoning. problem with the positioning? Yes. You know, Yes, we would love it if we had rate boats or some other equivalent so we could track on their ice, but of course we're on Antarctica, that's a pipe dream. It's happening in the Arctic, they're definitely able to do that under ice, but we're having to do dead reckoning. On the other hand, when they get that close, they're not actually, they're not moving that fast. At least yeah, the first no. year, we didn't have much trouble, you could see where they've been roughly. It just wasn't, just wasn't that far. Yeah. So, Thanks so thank much. You.